Well, what I'm what I'm going to be talking about today is the toric eye well. Um, toric eye wells are, are are just a fabulous adjunct to your practice. And if you want to make patients very, very happy, this is a, a type of lens that has almost no downside. And think back to what, what vision is. Vision for the human visual system is about contrast. And it's about sort of collapsing the Zernike tree and giving people the best contrast sensitivity. And with a toric eye well that's aspheric and adds negative spherical aberration, we actually address three Zernike coefficients independently, a defocus, first order astigmatism, and also we help to neutralize the spherical aberration of the cornea. And when we do that, as my wife likes to say, a couple of extra kernels get to pop in the popcorn machine. You know, the, a few other things happen as well. So I've spent a lot of time working with the toric eye well, and um, I'm going to share with you some of the insights that we've had in the, in the last uh, 10 years. Our office was one of the FDA uh, phase three study sites. These are some of the companies that I work with. Okay, well, let's start out with the, with the LensStar, what I like about it, and then Dr. Olson's covered this already, but with one button push, we get a lot of important information, and this is very accurate information. Um, I'm going to talk specifically today about the, the Ks, this dual-zone autokeratometry. It's kind of a unique and consistently accurate feature, and also the anterior chamber depth and lens thickness are by optical biometry. They're not a slit estimation. They're actual numbers measured by laser biometry. And if you're using something like the Olsen formula, this becomes a very critical component. And there's measurement flexibility. Um, the, the, what we like to say is that Hogstrite is treating all of us like adults. We get to look at the information. We get to make decisions about how it was done. We get to make adjustments. We get to delete and repeat if we want. There's no question as to how each of the measurements were, were made. And then I like the fact that the measurement head and the computer are completely separate. Instead of a dedicated computer board for the measurements, this instrument comes with just a regular Windows 7 computer. I can plug my own laptop in and do the measurements off my laptop. So we have tremendous flexibility, and I think it's set up in a very, very nice way. So again, the focus of what we're going to be doing today will be uh, keratometry. Now this is a distribution of uh, 6,000 eyes from, from my practice, and the first thing that pops up is that most of the patients we see of mostly European ancestry are low astigmats. And the reason why I bring this up is that the low astigmat is a kind of a unique challenge because getting the steep meridian measured correctly is a little bit more difficult than say somebody that has three, four, or five diopters. So this is the most of the patients you're going to be seeing. This is what the information looks like when it comes out of the of the lens star. And for each eye we just get this wealth of information uh, with each with each button push. We won't go into that. Okay, so I'm going to ask, challenge everyone here to begin to think differently about how you approach the toric eye well. And the toric eye well is basically two separate and independent exercises. The first exercise is calculating the spherical power. And so if we're going to put in a 21 diopter toric eye well, we do those measurements in the normal way. Now we're done with that aspect. But the second part is determining what toric power we're going to use and how we align that. And we have to start thinking the way the calculator thinks. And the calculator thinks different, um, and it's not intuitive. So the first thing we want to do is determine the orientation of the steep and the flat meridians. Okay, this is independent of calculating the spherical power. And then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to measure the power difference between meridians. And the reason why I bring this up in the context of the lens star is that the lens star is uniquely um, able to do this, and I'm going to show you some examples as to why. So get out of the mindset of just getting a set of Ks if you don't have a lens star. If you do have a lens star, this instrument can do all of this with just a single set of Ks. But if you don't, we have to approach it sort of differently. So one of the, one of the calls I get frequently is, you know, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. You know, that we, have, we have this patient and we have, uh, you know, manual Ks, auto Ks, Scheinflug Ks, uh, slit scanning Ks, and we took into account the patient's zodiac sign, mother's maiden name, favorite dessert, and shoe size, and now we're trying to come up with the appropriate toricity. Well, rather than taking the average of lots and lots of different measurements, let's use the measurements that really give us the information we want. One of the things that causes distress to physicians is that by all these different measurement types, they get different numbers. And of course, they're supposed to get different numbers because each of these instruments may measure a different uh, zone and they may also um, you employ a different algorithm. So if the Pentacam says one thing and the OrbScan says something else and the Islemaster says something else, you know what? They're supposed to say something different. They're not supposed to be the same. 
So let's talk about the humble keratometer because this has actually has some meaning in terms of the Lenstar. Now the, the keratometer is not a really accurate device and especially for the low astigmats, but it does allow us to do some very important things and that is take our time. With automated keratometer, you push a button, it's like a little digital camera, and whatever it does at that moment, is that's what you're stuck with. With the, with the manual keratometer, you can take your time, you can line up the meridian, you can determine the power, but trying to get all of those little floating rings to stay the same is like getting three cats to walk in a straight line. So what I, what I say is that take, take the horizontal drum and do your measurement, and then rotate that same drum 90 degrees and now you've thrown out of the window anything that has to do with calibration. There's no need for calibration because what we're doing is we're f uh, fulfilling the second part is we're looking for the power difference between meridians. Okay, let's go through this. And, and those of you here from, from Europe uh, are very familiar with the Javal instrument and that's exactly what this does. It measures in one meridian power um, and orientation. You rotate it 90 degrees and, and do the second. So that's, that's the game we're looking to play here. Now, if you have a low astigmat and with manual keratometry, you get the same view of the Myers across a 10 or 15 degree sweep. Um, this is what we use, Sam, we call this um, uh, Bobby Osher's credit card method. If you can outline this, the, the steep um, lobes of the astigmatism and you look at basically the three um, millimeter central zone, if you draw a line through each of the lobes and through the center, you can actually read the axis off the scale in the periphery. This can be nothing but the steep meridian. Can't be anything else. Okay. Okay, so I know here we're here at a Hogstride event, but how many of you use the Iowa Master for the Torque Iowa? Pretty much everybody's hand should go up because that's what you're using. You probably haven't got the Lenstar yet, that's why you're here. Okay, well, Zeiss never, never intended the Iowa Master to be used for the Toric Eye Well, although that's what most people use because it's easy to do. It was intended to be used to determine the spherical power of the Eye Well, K1 plus K2 divided by 2. And one of the paradoxes of the Iowa Master is for a lot of patients, it's dead on, it's correct, it works wonderfully. And then for a subset of patients, it's awful, and we have absolutely no idea why. The validation criteria for Almaster K's is three measurements within a quarter diopter in each of the principal meridians. So if you look at the, this printout here from the Almaster, well, it looks perfect. All of the K1, 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 exactly the same. K2, 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 exactly the same. But what's different? Well, the steep axis is different. And it can be different in some very large ways. So let's take a look behind the curtain and see what the Almaster is doing. Okay, so here's how the Owl Master measures the cornea. We have six measurements. We have three above and three below the horizontal. And so we have measurements at uh, 0, 60, uh, 120, and 180. Now, let's say that Grandma has her steep meridian at 90. Well, the, the instrument's measuring over here and over here. It's not measuring there. So the, this paradox can be answered by the fact that if the steep meridian corresponds with where the instrument's measuring, it works fine. But a lot of the time, the, the steep meridian that the machine comes up with and where it's measuring are completely different. So we can look at uh, this measurement here, and you can see that you know, we're not measuring where the steep meridian is. And this just has to do with density of measurements. Here's the lens star. And the lens star, you can see just from the reflected image off the case, it has a much higher density uh, for measurement. And not only that, but it measures twice. So you know, we have one ring of 16 measurements and we have another ring of 16, that's 32 measurements. And if we look at measurement number three here, there's the steep and the flat meridians. Take away the numbers and you can see that the measurements are much, much closer. There's almost no iteration that has to be done. And the chance of the steep meridian lining up with the area of measurement is very, very high. Now again, Hogstride is treating us like adults. They allow us to actually see how the measurements are done. And if you look here, um, this is with one button push. We have four of these measurements right here. You can see that on measurement number one, we may have a dry spot on the cornea. It shows up. So the LED reflection is, is bad in that area. And if that comes up as one of our meridians, we may want to delete and repeat or give the patient some artificial tears or do something to clean that up. Now again, a measurement's only as good as our ability to know what it means. And with any instrument, we have validation criteria. And the validation criteria for the Lenstar are um, a quarter diopter, a standard deviation for each of the measurements in each of the meridians, and within three and a half diopters 
for the power. So these here on the left would be valid and the ones on the right would, be, would not and then we would go ahead and uh, delete and repeat. So the reason why I brought up the, the, the manual keratometer is when the Lenstar first came out, um, uh, Bobby Osher, um, Kerry Solomon, uh, myself, some others did, did a study where we just, we just took measurements, no validation criteria, no nothing, just did a set of measurements and compared it to manual keratometry. And what we found was that without validation criteria, it was pretty close, and when we added validation criteria, it was statistically the same as manual keratometry. Remember, the, ma the manufacturer of the toric eye well recommends manual keratometry, and we've shown that to be the, the instrument to be equal even without um, any validation criteria. A study has just been closed on the, on the Lenstar with uh, 106 eyes from five clinical sites uh, in both Europe and the United States. In fact, Sam Maskett was one of the, was one of the investigators. And we had almost 80% of eyes were within half a diopter for the refractive astigmatism. That's huge. That's probably the best numbers that I've ever seen you know, for that particular lens. Okay, so let's, let's just do a quick example and we'll close things up here. Um, this is one of my own patients, and it's a set of measurements with the Iowmaster and a set of measurements with the Lenstar. And if you look at the magnitude of astigmatism, it's within a quarter diopter. So most people would say that's a pretty good agreement. But if you look at the, the approximation of the steep and the flat meridians, you can see that they don't coincide. And this is a very common story told over and over again with the eye master. So which one of these do we use? This is the phone call that I get you know, from time to time. Okay, so let's get out Bobby Osher's um, MasterCard and uh, draw a line through the corneal vertex and the steep, and the steep lobes on, on our to topographic map, paying attention mostly to the three millimeter area, and that's what we get right there. Okay, so that, that we know is probably gonna be our steep meridian. So if we look at the eye master, if we look at 106, let's see what 106 looks like guess what? The machine didn't get it right. Why? Because it's measuring here and here and extrapolating something up here. And it just, you know, it's kindergarten simple to see why that happens. Let's look at the Lenstar, of course, 93, and there's 93. It gets it. And it's no big secret as to why that works. It just has higher measurement density. So if we do the calculation with the Owlmaster, it takes a T6, different meridian, and with a T7 with the Lenstar. Remember, astigmatism is a vector, which means it has both magnitude and direction. And you can get hammered equally well if you're off on the power or you're off on the orientation. So we see the patient in my office. And of course, I wouldn't show this to you if it didn't work. But um, there's, there's day number one. Okay, works great. But let's look at what would have happened if we would have used the, the Iowa Master case. And remember, the magnitude was within one quarter diopter between the two instruments, but it was just the orientation of the steep meridian that was different. So the angular error is greater than one and a half diopters, and the toric IOL power error is a little bit more than one diopter. This is that two diopter surprise that came completely out of nowhere using low density keratometry because of all the iteration that has to take place. So what are really the best practices for the toric eye? Well, you need to have topography to confirm regular astigmatism. And if you have a low astigmat, it's not a bad idea just to draw a line through those lobes uh, to make sure. Optical biometry for the, for the spherical power, you know, by whatever method you use, works fine, just what you've, ever, what you've always done. But you need to determine the power difference between meridians and also the location of the steep and the flat meridian. And for us, the Lenstar is absolutely perfect. Those of you who know me know that in the dictionary next to the word obsessive is my photograph, okay? And until the Lenstar came out, I did all my own Javal keratometry on every single patient myself. The, our instrument now just has a cover over it. We're not using it anymore. So this is what we're using for our toric eye wells. And then you should uh, calculate your average surgically induced astigmatism. There are a number of tools on the internet uh, for that. So, so basically, just to repeat, you know, closely spaced, high density uh, measurements are really the key to why this instrument works well. And this is one of the few instruments that actually does this very well. And it's uniquely suited for the toric eye well. Thank you. And, and actually, let me, let me share with you one other thing. We, we originally got the Lenstar not because of the Ks. We got the Lenstar because of the anterior chamber depth and lens thickness. We actually fell into the Ks. It, it was a... Um, it, it was an epiphany on our part that we hadn't planned on, and the Ks were so impressive, they really completely just jumped out for us. And for the Toric Eye Well, it, it's really changed our practice. So we, we love this instrument for that purpose and for many other reasons as well.
Well, I'd like to thank you, Warren, for a great sure. presentation and uh, thank all of the speakers. And thank you all for coming on this uh, rainy evening. So, thanks, all. Thank <clears throat> you.